Thank you, and please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Andrew Wolk. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, talking more from sort of you all as possible people that have ideas and want to start them. Tell you a quick story about a recent uh, MIT Sloan student that came back and spoke in my class. Um, along with that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. Uh, and then I'm going to then switch to um, some thinking I have about um, sort of evolution and trends that I'm seeing about how we're actually going to tackle big social issues um, and finish off by giving you guys some pointers on what I think is a 21st century leader if you're interested in actually using your skills graduating to actually enter this field. But I wanted to start because I actually think that um, having been an undergrad, a graduate student, and now teaching it at a graduate school, that you all actually um, have this tremendous opportunity, whether you're a freshman or a senior right now. You're given this um, free time where you're paying to sort of practice ideas. And you may not actually think about college that way or business school that way. But actually, um, it was interesting to have a student come back this year to talk about a business that he's now launched which is actually both um, helping with sanitation in Kenya, while at the same time turning that sanitation into profits. And what's less interesting is not the innovation, but how he got the business off the ground in terms of the message about thinking about you all as students, but are you students or are you being given this time for free to actually test your ideas without a lot of risk? Here's what I mean by that. So this uh, student at Sloan comes to school, and he goes on a hiking trip. And on that hiking trip, he starts to talk with another student, and they start to talk about this idea they have because they heard that you know sanitation is a really big issue, and maybe there's some way that they could help to try to deal with that. They had both traveled around the world and noticed that people who live in poverty have um, sanitation issues. So they entered a class, and in that class, they just briefly started to explore what that idea might be. They came out of that class, and they, they actually entered, not unlike this ideas competition, a competition very similar to that. And they came in, I think, like fourth. Um, from that competition, they actually went and they applied, finding some university resources, a little bit of money to go to Kenya and actually start to test out some of their thinking, talk to local people, think about their idea, they got a little bit more traction. Then they came back after that. And what did they do? They did some really interesting things. They started to go across campus to other parts of the school for areas of expertise they needed and started to build a team from the engineering school, from the room policy school. They re-entered a different competition at MIT. And then they started to enter competitions all over the country. And all of a sudden, they went from just this hiking trip to actually a full-blown startup, all while they were just still in school, starting to build their team from just the students they have, using the different competitions to start to raise, you know, 2,500 bucks here, 3,000 bucks there, 5,000 bucks here. And lastly, and what I thought was most important about the story, was they actually started to enroll themselves in classes that specifically were teaching them things that they needed to figure out for the business itself. So they took a pricing class, because they really had no idea how to price the waste that they were trying to deal with that they were then going to resell back to the Kenyan government. They took a marketing class, because they had no idea what to call the company, so they actually used the marketing class to figure out how to learn about branding. And what was really interesting about the story was, each step of the way, there was very little risk. And the challenge that happens when you're in a startup situation is once you're in it and you're out of school, the risk really raises, right? Your parents are asking you, why are you not getting a job? Um, you're wondering where the next dollar is going to come. Are you going to make payroll? All these sort of challenges that come with a startup, by thinking about school, if you're entrepreneurial and have this interest and passion, as a way to test your ideas by using the assets that you have within that school. And I share that story with you because from what I understand, many of you are in classes right now or concentrating on entrepreneurship to just think about your time here if you're interested in a startup as a time to really test those ideas and use it as a time which is really free time for you all. 
Now, I was not that smart. That's not what I did. <laughs> um, I did not use my time at school to actually test my ideas completely. My, um, my grandfather was a councilman. He uh, was a councilman in Pittsburgh who spent 25 years of his life coming up with a lot of pretty interesting innovations. He was the founder of smog control in Pittsburgh. He started the first school of public health, um, Civic Light Opera, and was pretty unique about him. And why he was able to do that at that time is that Pittsburgh was a place where a lot of the big industries were happening during the 50s when he was a councilman, steel. Um, and a lot of the big foundations you know today were the big titans and Carnegie and Mellon, for example. So he actually was able to develop relationships with some of those philanthropists, use those relationships to get a lot of interesting innovations off the ground like I just described. My father um, was a 25-year veteran on Wall Street. Um, so tried and true capitalist, um, trying to make and maximize his profits, which we know all about in today's economy. Um, my journey and what I'm doing in my work, quite frankly, is just the angst of how those two worlds fit together. That one side of the equation, which is this you know, sincere commitment for public service and trying to figure out how we can make a difference in the world, coupled with the fact that we live in the strongest capitalist society in the world that's sort of about profit maximization at the same time. And how do those two concepts fit together um, is really sort of the pursuit and journey that I've been on ever since I really started to go into this field. So how did that journey begin? Well, um, followed in my father's footsteps, and I actually started on Wall Street. Um, I soon left there because it was just not my thing, not my cup of tea. Um, it's not that it shouldn't be for some. It just wasn't for me. And I went through a series of careers that was my own journey to explore what I was most interested in. Um, I was in film for a moment in time. Um, I um, started my own business, which I'll talk about briefly in terms of the journey. Um, I went traveling to sort of explore the world, which was also part of my education. Each step of the way, I think I was learning different things, beginning to understand what it is that I'd be most interested in. Along the ways, I did do a startup. It's not root cause. Um, root, the, the one I did had some level of success. Uh, it was a multi-restaurant delivery service. You may have them here in Atlanta. It's a pretty basic concept. Gather a whole bunch of restaurants together. You'll say that you'll publish a magazine or do it online is probably the way to do it now. And I'll deliver from any restaurant to you anywhere for a certain price. Terrible business. I was saying I used to teach entrepreneurship, and I would start out class by saying, why is this? a terrible business to be in. And if you were my class, I'd ask you to try to figure it out. But I'll tell you that um, you're dealing with um, people who have another job, so you have no control over them. You are working lunch and dinner, so the hours are terrible. And there's no quality control over the work. So you've just got all the makings of just a business you just want to get out of as quickly as possible. And you should think about that when you think about what um, ideas you may be generating. You're really going to like the business you started, and you're going to want to work at it. That's really important. But, but in that business, what happened to me was I started to realize that what I was really enjoying about that business was the types of people I was employing. And I was noticing that by giving them a job that I was actually really truly impacting their lives. And at that point in my life, I had actually never stepped foot in a nonprofit. I had never volunteered a day in my life. I was 28 years old. And I was just thinking I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to start this business. And I was going to go and do that. And we were very successful. We grew it starting in Stanford, Connecticut. and we grew it to be all over, if you know that area, all over Fairfield County, Connecticut. Um, there were a couple of smaller services that we acquired, and it was doing quite well. But I started a couple of programs in there which had really nothing to do with the business. I started bringing bankers in to help my employees get mortgages, because I noticed that I thought if they could build an asset, that that would help them to have a better life moving forward. So that was something I did just on my own. I also, because most people I employed had a job during the day, so I put software programs on the computer terminals while they were waiting for the phone to pick up, and they increased their skills so they could perhaps have, um, get better career ladder in the jobs that they had when they back back in the morning. And I started to say to myself, this is interesting. My business actually has this opportunity to actually make people's lives better besides just the paycheck I gave them. And that's when I started to, I, I think the web was there, because this is uh, 1992 through 1997. Um, started to just recognize that the people were starting to talk about the role business could play in change. 
hadn't known much about it. I think it was just beginning to be talked about. You know, I think the term social entrepreneurship was perhaps around terms like corporate social responsibility. But it was clear that I had finally found something I was pretty interested in. So I decided to put my business up for sale um, and oddly go back to business school. So I started and sold the business, but then I went back to business school. But I went back to business school um, to get a degree in nonprofit management and entrepreneurship where I could get a concentration of those two. It was at, it was at Boston University. And I had this um, one of two big turning points that got me to understand where I thought that I could really add value. <clears throat> Um, I sold my business, and right before I went back to school, I found myself working um, as a volunteer for my first time um, in Rudy Giuliani's administration in, in New York City. Um, and the job, unpaid, was in what's called a voluntary action center. I'm not sure they're called that anymore. And my job was simply to interview people who were interested in volunteering, find out what they're interested in, and look at a database, and within that database, tell them that here's a nonprofit they may want to go and match with. So if you came in and you said, I'm interested in animals, I would look up and see whether the local animal shelter was looking volunteer. I'd click print, I'd hand them a piece of paper, and they'd leave. I think at the time they were getting, let's say, approximately $3 million as a line item in the Giuliani budget. And I asked the person who was my supervisor if they had any idea what happened when the people left. And she said, we don't do that. you know." You're giving me the number of people you see, and then I'm reporting to my boss how many people we've seen over a given year, and we're trying to hit that target. And if we hit that target, we should be able to maintain our budget. So I asked her if she wouldn't mind if I would just go back and sort of track maybe the last six months of people to see whether I could find out you know, what happened once they left, and I, there, they handed that piece of paper. What I found was is they were actually matching about 3% of the people who came in. That only 3% of the people that were actually coming through the door had actually solidified a volunteer relationship. That didn't even tell you, because there were only 3%, whether the relationship lasts, it added any value to the volunteer, whether it added any value to the nonprofit. Now, you might say that's alarming, but that actually was not the most alarming fact. The most alarming fact was that when I went back to my supervisor and I told her this, she said, that's not what we're being measured by. What we're being measured by is the number of people that we're seeing. And <clears throat> I had just gone through um, literally a fair, fair amount of hell um, over the last, past seven years, starting a business, raising money, going through a tough time to have to try to meet payroll, getting a line of credit, borrowing money from friends and family, packaging my business for sale, um, really rigorous due diligence each step of the way. And here was this world where I thought it was just a simple thing I was asking, and it was completely um, ignorant to them why it would matter. And it sort of hit me like that, um, that um, what I thought was a pretty good skill set I had was entrepreneurial instincts, business instincts. I had gone undergrad to business, that I could bring that expertise to social change. So I left there thinking that I was um, pretty strong and vigorous in what I was going to bring to the world. So that was number one of the two big turning points. <clears throat> number two, so I get to business school, and I think that I now have all the answers. <clears throat> so in having all the answers, not unlike I'm telling you, what I decided to do was to start to learn about the nonprofit sector to bestow the greatness that I had just learned from my startup experience and from that one volunteer experience, I started to go out to various nonprofits in the community to try to tell them what I thought were the answers to what all the things that they were doing wrong. Fortunately, they didn't really see it that way. Um, instead, they told me, you have no idea what you're talking about. You don't know what it's like to do mission-based work. How can you tell me what to do? Business is evil, you know, all sorts of opposing points of view. And that was the other big turning point, that I realized that while I may have some interesting insights, like today, that you might think are interesting, that the world of social change, the world of actually trying to deal with social issues is much more complicated and complex than a balance sheet and an income statement. <clears throat> and if I was going to begin to actually be able to talk about the things that I thought I knew in a setting where we're actually trying to affect people's lives and people who are so passionate and committed their life to helping a kid get a better education or help someone get out of poverty. I need to learn how to speak their language. 
I need to really understand who they were and why they were doing this work. Um, and you know, between those two experiences of this balance of what I thought was bringing more rigor with this balance of really understanding mission-based work has really been the driver of the balance that I've tried um, to walk each step of the way. So some of you have may have been on my website or seen our work. Um, that's really the fine line. We, we, we really do try to bring a real balance between those two. And I think we're, that journey is still trying to happen because um, it is a fine line between how you actually can affect change but bring more, more rigor when you're trying to affect change at the same time. So I left business school. Um, I had one small stint where um, I tried another startup. This one failed. <clears throat> um, and um, it was a national magazine. Why I thought that I actually could start a national magazine to this day, I'm not quite sure. It's a terrible business. Um, it's next to impossible without lots of capitalization. Um, but it was probably good to go through a failure. But when I was starting that business, what I recognized was that, um, that many people that were in my position um, who were trying to start or grow organizations that were dealing with social issues actually needed expertise. And slowly, people in town, once I was taking a little bit of a softer approach, were coming to me and wanting certain levels of expertise from them. And so I decided to start Root Cause because it was clear to me that um, having a consulting arm that could actually offer expertise could be of real value um, to nonprofit organizations. And that was the impetus. We did see that we thought that the different sectors should work together, but you know, in all um, candor in the early parts of Root Cause, I think it was, can we find a business model with a consulting practice that could actually go out and support nonprofits? Um, and then we had a little bit of luck. <clears throat> um, and the little bit of luck is where um, my startup experience goes to the talk that I'm going to briefly share with you. Uh, we, um, what I recognized when I started to meet with different organizations was that, and I think some of you are actually using the book, is that nonprofits were all using strategic plans. Um, and those strategic plans were actually developed based on um, like a two-day retreat. Um, they'd go for a weekend, and they would set like um, five goals, they'd revisit their mission and their vision, and they'd be done. Um, I had just had to go through a fairly rigorous process to write a business plan, rewrite a business plan to raise money. And I didn't understand why the same process was not used in the nonprofit sector. So we started to try, me and one colleague, to start to think about and work with really any nonprofit that would work with us on what would a business plan look like for dealing with a social problem. Um, we got a few guinea pigs to work with us started to build a little bit of a reputation. And we had this one client um, that came to us uh, from a very large national foundation called the Atlanta Philanthropies. Um, at this point, Root Cause was just starting out. The, uh, we had been practicing this business planning methodology. And this uh, probably 62-year-old woman, woman called me up, and she said, um, I understand you've been helping this other really small organization in Portland, Maine, and I need a business plan. I don't know what a business plan is, but Atlantic Philanthropies told me that I need one, and so I want to talk to you. She'd been given a whole bunch of other names from the foundation. Um, and she had started this organization called ITN Portland, which was dealing with the senior transportation issue, which is a, which is a very simple. The average person outlives their driver's license by seven to nine years. Um, the senior population is expected to double over the next 30 to 40 years. And the majority of all people use their car to get places in concentrated areas. So you have all of these people that will not be able to get anywhere. And currently, um, there are some solutions, but those solutions are very minimal in how you can get around. And so she started a 24-7, 365 day a year service where for a small membership fee and half the price of a taxi, you could call her up and she would take you anywhere you want, whenever you want. And at that time, she was doing 15,000 rides in Portland, Maine. She went to Atlantic Philanthropies for a million dollars for technology to grow her model. And Atlantic said, we'll give you a little bit of money to write a business plan and we'll think about it. So I met this woman at the time I was teaching at BU at a small bar. And um, we had just been 
playing with a few different organizations with our ideas. Um, I was moving from BU to Sloan. And um, she decided to work with us. And she said, you know, at the end of the whole project, for two reasons only. One was our price was a third of the prices of everybody else. <laughs> and two, because if I was going from BU to MIT, probably was making a pretty good bet. Um, it had nothing to do with how we thought. She said she had no idea what a business plan was. She just was doing it to do it for, for the sake of doing it. Um, what did we do? We poured all of our thinking into the work. And her $300,000 organization, Atlanta gave him $3.2 million to capitalize her plan to spread it around the country, not unlike the way the private sector would work. Um, from that, Atlantic, right place, right time, like you'll hear many entrepreneurial stories, um, found that the way we approached the work that we did with her, they started giving us many, many, much more work than we could actually handle. Um, I think if we didn't have that moment in time, I'm not sure we would have been able to grow the way we did, be able to produce the book that some of you may have seen to get to the sort of size and credibility we have. And, and, and the kernel of that is while perseverance and all the other things that you might hear in the entrepreneurship courses you take is there's a lot of luck of which you have to see what the luck is in capitalizing the opportunity. Because there was a lot of luck that she was introduced and she decided to work with us. And then we just poured everything we did. I mean, what she charged us, what, 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 what we charged her was a fraction of the amount that we would charge today for our work. But we took a bet, whether that was the right bet or not. And, and I say that just because as you think about the ideas that you may be developing, you got to balance luck. I think Jim Collins' book, new book, is about this, actually. You got to balance luck with opportunity each step of the way. That's just so critical. So from that allowed us to get root cause off the ground and um, really becomes the basis for the work that I'm going to talk about with you now as I sort of transition from sort of startup stories and my own founding. Because my thinking has evolved a lot since that thinking that a business plan was really going to be the key to everything. Um, to actually, uh, you know, a much more sophisticated problem I think we have about why it is that we're maybe having challenges around how we actually advance um, issues um, that we really care about a lot. So um, I think that there's a new construct that's beginning to emerge for 21st century problem solving. And, um, the first part of that construct that I'll talk to you about is that we need to start to get as good about how we advance innovation, which we've become very good at in our country and the world, as we do about social innovation, the idea of innovative ideas to advance social problems. But I believe that the only way we're going to do that is if we start to actually create what we're calling social impact markets, similar to capital markets, but from a social impact perspective. And in order to do that, and things I'm going to share with you as leaders going out in the world who may be interested in this subject, we're going to need a new type of leadership that's emerging. So what do I mean by we must advance social innovation? Well, let's just take a look from my perspective on where we are right now. Right now, we have trillions of dollars that go into literally millions of nonprofit and government institutions and programs. Um, I don't know what the count here is in the city of Atlanta or the state of Georgia, but I know that the average statistic is 115 nonprofits start a day. Um, in Boston, you, you know, you, you throw a rock and you're going to hit a nonprofit. Um, and the reality is, is that we're not making significant progress on the social issues I think we care about most. So we've got tons of money going in to the programs and institutions and yet, are we really making the progress we want? You know, this data source is old because now, if you saw the census data that just came out recently, there's a lot more evidence of this. But from 2000 and 2008, for a couple of data points here, the US population grew by 6.8%. The number of people in poverty grew by 18%. Got plenty of programs that say they're trying to deal with that issue, so why is that happening? Another one. During that same period of time, the number of young people, and this number has also gone up significantly, who are not attending school, not working, or have no degree beyond high school has increased by 30%. Plenty of programs dealing with dropout prevention, college access, so on and so forth. So, so there's something wrong from my perspective 
on that picture. At the same time, why is this more important than ever right now? Well, you know, we hear more and more every time we hear a presidential cycle about education and health care and stuff like that. But I would actually argue that the issues I'm going to bring up right now are actually critical to our ability to just advance generally. It's like we can't wait any longer. We're starting to hear more and more that we actually have to deal with our education system if we're going to compete in the global economy. That's a social issue. That's not finding the next great industry. Energy. We're hearing more and more that you know it's finally come to the point where we need to find alternatives. So this is no longer a something we talk about, but more we really have to pay much closer attention to this. While we got ourselves a health care bill, there are very few people that say that health care bill actually dealt with quality and cost. Coming from my state, Massachusetts, our health care bureau is blowing up on us. So while it helped to get everyone to have health care, the cost keeps going up and the quality is relatively the same. So it was more of a Band-Aid. Workforce development. We're hearing more and more that the people that are being trained for the jobs of tomorrow are not sufficient for what those jobs are. So each one of these are telling us that what one would view as the social issues that we should be trying to do to, let's say, help people are actually the critical issues for us to actually have societal progress, which puts us in a situation where the ideas of social innovation become that much more important. So one may say, OK, well, um, government is the place where we need to look to. Well, we've got another problem there. Because the problem is, is that can the pie get any bigger? This is generally the pie chart for spending on social issues in the United States, where you might not realize it, but most of the money comes from government for either the government programs they run or the grants and contracts that they put out there. This chart shows you the US government spending as a percentage of GDP. Um, this is during the World War, so it skyrockets. This is going up because of the combination of the recession and the two wars that we're fighting. And now we've got this whole budget deficit. There is no money. <laughs> there is no money. And as far as I understand it, with the recovery we're having right now, if we can even call that, whether it's the city, the state, or the federal government, no time in the near future are the coffers going to be really full to figure out what we can do about that money, do about that. So that's really where innovation and entrepreneurship thrives and is at its best, right? Innovation and entrepreneurship is new ideas, figuring out new, more efficient ways to do things, finding transformative ways to take old problems and figure out new solutions. So you hear all this talk, if you listen really closely, about the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship for the private sector. But it's really no different for the issues I talk about as well. It's why we actually have to be much more clear about how we're going to advance social innovation, not unlike how we're going to actually advance regular innovation. So it becomes critical that we take social innovation as importantly as we think about regular innovation. <clears throat> but there's a problem with that. And that's because of the way the markets work right now. So right now, um, if you are someone who's trying to start a business, while not perfect, and it certainly is hard, it's a fairly simple equation where performance, capital follows performance, and continues to follow performance along the way. <clears throat> so you're sitting in class here, and you come up with some idea. Market disseminates data about how well you're doing. And investors of those ideas are going to invest in the strong performers. Investors are going to penalize weak performers. So the market is actually incentivizing performance for you to get continuous investment and innovations grow. If you, start, if you have a come up with a good idea and it begins to show that you could actually make a profit, return the money back, whether it's a loan or equity, you're going to find capital. And if you keep showing more success, you're going to find more capital. That's generally the way it works because people want to make money. So while it's not a completely perfect system, it's pretty clear how it works. Um, you know the bank. You know the rules. There are angel investors, venture capital investors. The rules of the game are pretty clear. <clears throat> how does it work in what I would call the social impact market? <clears throat> so here's how it works. So you come up with an idea. 
<clears throat> right now, we really don't have any data that tells us about performance right now. It's like this huge fragmented area where each social issue is different. You've got thousands of organizations working on the same issues. So the performance information by organizations is limited by their capacity. They're, they're, they're not measuring that much. There's no public transparency of some way. So investment is based more on storytelling and relationship building. It's not like you go and you show that I have these great outcomes and people start swimming to start to throw you money. So what do organizations do right now? And they're smart to do this. They build strong development departments because <clears throat> that's what they should do. They can tell, tell really good stories. When they build strong development departments, actually the things that are really working, they don't really have the opportunity to spread because the problem is, is that if you're just being focused on who is the best storyteller, relationship builder, that doesn't necessarily mean that the work you're doing is the best. I can tell you countless <laughs> examples of things that are working that don't have the smartness to actually market them pretty well. So there's a gap. There's a gap between the things that are working um, and how you actually get them for more people to adopt them overall. <clears throat> so if we want to advance social innovation, which is what we must do, we got to figure out how we can fix this market problem. <clears throat> so um, what I am calling a social impact market is a mechanism that provides the infrastructure, information, and incentive to enable individuals or institutions to provide fo financial, volunteer, and kind resources with the expectation of impact. So it's not now about relationships. It's not about storytelling, not that those aren't important. It's a transaction that's based on impact. <clears throat> and the reason why I'm not just including money here, but also volunteer time and in-kind resources, they're actually a core to how a lot of models can work. So for example, let's take Habitat for Humanity. A key part of Habitat for Humanity's workforce is the volunteer that comes to do a build, to build a home. <clears throat> so, the more we can organize those volunteers, the faster Habitat for Humanity can actually do its work. In-kind resources are not that different. Um, the more that, <clears throat> in fact, I was hearing a story about um, one of the classes is dealing with used soap, <clears throat> right? That's an in-kind donation that they get out um, to uh, third world developing countries, right? So it's an in-kind donation. So, how does that in-kind donation get maximized to make sure that it's resulting in social impact? For example, if we get that soap and we send it off to a third world country and we find out that the people that we got the soap to actually aren't using it, well, that was not probably the best use of the soap. So we may get, we may laud them for the fact that they're doing this great thing. You know, I heard the story and I'm like, yeah, I throw away my soap all the time. But the reality is we really want to know that that soap is actually getting to the place where we say that it is, that it's actually being used by the people. They're actually more sanitary because of that. And there's so much money between financial, volunteer, and in-kind that we're not organizing in a way for impact that <clears throat> it could be quite transformative without us actually needing any more resources. Now the interesting thing about this, for those of you who are thinking about starting ideas, is that there are actually quite a lot of early signs. You know, Even if we don't call it markets, <clears throat> um, there are examples of that I want to share with you. Some of them you've heard of, maybe none of them you have. Um, so the first is there's now beginning to be this emergence of research analyst reports. Um, we happen to be an organization that has started doing these, but there are three or four organizations that are doing them as well. In the private sector, um, it's what they solely rely on to make investments. Um, in the early 70s, they started with research companies like Gartner Group, Yankee Group, Forrester Research, but now every Wall Street firm has their research departments. So what, if, what about research that actually tells you what the college access market looks like, right? National level, what works best in the city of Atlanta? And what about within those research reports if it tells you what it looks like to know what a high performer looks like? So you can actually use real data to really understand what they're like. So then actually people that provide the resources, can actually use hard data to get a better understanding of allocate them. Um, so these are actually beginning to be used and are becoming more and more public for people to actually use. And this type of analysis report was actually how markets got far more organized on the private sector. <clears throat> Next thing is emerging, which I've heard um, that there are some that are here. 
locally is social innovation funds. Also, we could call them impact investing, which you may have heard about. Um, some of you may have heard about Acumen Fund, which is an international fund. Um, we, there's also the Federal Social Innovation Fund that emerged. Um, the I3 is an education fund focused on impact. Um, there are lots of uh, impact investing funds, investing in for-profit social ventures. All of these have one thing in common. They are fundamentally only about allocating their resources based on impact. They're managing the money in that way. Um, the amount of money it adds up to is not tremendous compared to the total amount of money that's transferring. But it's, again, an early sign of the way that impact markets can get formed. One of the ones that I'm probably um, most encouraged about, uh, not because I, I'm really sure how it can actually scale, but because of what it means, is this idea of outcome-based preferred provider government contracts. That's a mouthful. But I don't know how many people have heard of the social impact bond. Um, Social, and, and I'll explain it to you because it's really quite intriguing. So the social impact bond was created in the UK. Obama put it in his most recent budget, which chances of it getting through are probably zero. But it spurred this whole thing where I think there are like seven states right now that are all trying to be the first. Here's how it works. Pretty interesting. I'm a government agency, and I'm granting out or contracting out $2 million right now to a host of nonprofits. And I'm not sure because the contracts are set up more as um, programmatic to serve certain people the government no longer does. Let's say uh, people who get out of prison. Um, uh, the way it works is the cost for providing that service, you find a philanthropist who instead will cover that cost. If the nonprofit or the series of nonprofits can actually deliver the same service for an outcome at a less cost, then the government will pay the cost, and the savings will become a return to the philanthropist. So you've got two interesting incentives that are going on there. You've got one incentive for the nonprofit to be much more focused on outcomes in the most cost-effective way. You've got incentives by the private philanthropist to perhaps um, put up some risk capital. You've got the government, who's now developing a very different relationship with um, the nonprofit um, that's been a contract or grant-based relationship. I'm encouraged by this less because um, I think it's going to be very hard to get the pilots off the ground. If you're really interested in them, we did a talk with some of the, the, the leading people trying to figure this out, someone from the Kennedy School, a woman with something called social finance. Um, you can go on our website and hear the talk to really understand them. What I think is most interesting is it's creating this conversation between government and nonprofit. And that's where the big money is. That's where the big relationships are that we have to figure out how to get the markets moving in a more efficient way. So again, another sign of these early social impact markets. Lastly is this idea about issue-focused allocation of res uh, volunteers. And that actually we're seeing signs as well. Um, the One Star Foundation is a foundation in Texas that decided they're the people that get all the AmeriCorps and VISTA slots, if you're familiar with those volunteer programs out of the National Corporation, Corporation for National Community Service, they decided they can use all of their volunteers just on education. And not only that, they're going to use all their volunteers on education for the nonprofits that they believe are showing the best evidence they're actually having impact. So they're harnessing all of the volunteers that they're getting from um, <clears throat> the corporation in that one area. City year, which, is there a city here? I think there's a city year in Atlanta. Um, that's the organization that um, you do a year of service out in your community. Well, up until four or five years ago, they were basically promoting volunteerism as a good thing to do. I, I'm not sure how many of you know, but they've completely transformed the way they actually allocate their volunteers. Their core now goes in to schools with a total focus on reducing dropout rate. So their core is now a dropout reduction strategy. So highly focused allocation of that volunteer service towards social impact in some sort of way. And these are just early signs of what I believe are going to be um, more and more of a formation of different ways for a social impact markets to be formed where 
resources get allocated basically by performance. So, so besides this being an interesting talk, talk perhaps, wh why should you care? Um, for those of you who are thinking about doing any type of work that has to do with social change, for-profit or non-profit, to operate in this environment, which I think is what the future looks like, it's going to take a new kind of leadership. And I'm going to share with you what I think are the five principal characteristics. Um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So number one, um, you know, in the past, I think you could actually have an interesting idea, come up with it, and it's actually not that difficult to start a nonprofit. Um, now, you're going to need to be far more versed in what the social issue is that you're really trying to address and how to analyze that issue. Um, you're really going to need to understand, if you really want to help kids increase their literacy rates, you really need to understand what the issue is about, what the challenges are about that. It will not only give you a competitive edge, but it will eventually be the norm, not the exception. So that's the first competency. The second is, um, you know, more now than ever, the expectations are that you know how to build real organizations. It's not enough anymore to just sort of go out there and have an organization that doesn't have a solid team, is able actually to know how to build that team and do all the things that organizational development needs in a regular for-profit structure. Um, so that competency is, is going to be a, a very critical one. Um, organizational sustainability, which is where the, the field of social entrepreneurship really started, um, is now really essential. We're in a resource-constrained environment. It's harder and harder to raise money. So the ability to really understand what your business model is, you hear about business models on the for-profit side, but what your business model is, when you're dealing with a social venture for profit or nonprofit, becomes a critical competency. Starting with that initially is critically important. Strategic collaboration. You hear collaboration is important all the time, but really understanding where your work fits in with the other sectors and the other players, whether it's government, business, similar organizations doing your work is going to be another critical component if you have any aspirations for growth. And lastly, and the one that's um, probably from my perspective <clears throat> the most important is this idea of adaptive learning. Um, using measurement as a tool for how you grow and adjust as you're moving along. Um, as opposed to an evaluation tool or something that you're supposed to do. Um, but how do you actually be adaptive and learn along the way and adjust as best that you can? Um, I share these with you because if we go back to uh, my story, my story has just been a series of adjustments to my thinking along the way. While I've been doing that, you know, I've been trying to get a better assessment analysis of what's going on in the market, trying to build a stronger and stronger organization for root cause, figuring out my business model, which is a consulting practice primarily, recognizing I've got to reach out more and more and work with a lot more. I can't do it on my own. And I'm measuring and adjusting all the time as we go. So as you all think about these points in your own ideas, um, think about how they might change the way you think about your own leadership, whether you're starting your own idea or going into your own work. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I think we have plenty of time for questions. There was no clock in the room. Well, thank you for coming very much. Uh, my name is David Veal. I'm a fourth year business administration major. And as a former banker, how do you feel that banking is going to be able to integrate with social responsibility? And I mean, you talked a little bit about how the, how the capital markets could hopefully change, but what, what's your outlook? Yeah, so um, I mean, my, my experience so far is um, you know, all of this work is going to be much more from a disruptive innovation perspective. I think with the exception of sort of outliers and some big banks that control a lot of money, I think evidence continues to need to be built on what returns could look like within a banking setting. Um, I, I think that um, for those of you who are familiar with the impact investing field, I think if you were to go and look, there's some interesting things that are emerging. There is one person, for example, at JP Morgan who 
if you looked up a report on J.P. Morgan Impact Investing. He's trying to say that there's an important asset class. I think there's a lot of talk right now about how people could think differently about how they allocate their money. Um, but I, I would be honest. I, I would have to be honest and say I'm fairly skeptical. Um, you know, the maximization of return is is still chiefly most important. And I think what's probably more important is that the people who are involved on the other side continue to just get really rigorous, whatever it is that they're trying to prove out, um, as the way that things are going to actually move the <coughs> dial. Because, you know, on the other side of the equation, I mean, they just have lots of pressures on them. Um, and you know, as a as a bank, you're there to make money, um, and and we can't forget about that. And the best way to think about it is, you know, if you're if you're a pure nonprofit, you are just trying to figure out how to do good. And if you're a pure for-profit, you're trying to maximize return. And if you're kind of somewhere in between, investors don't know what to make of that. They really don't. It's like I'm either a philanthropist or I'm an investor. And, and that's a confusing gray space to be. And banking doesn't really know what to do about that. I guess uh, this uh, is kind of motivated as a social interpreter or entrepreneur, rather. Um, you're not only motivated by building something that's sustainable, right? But you're trying to put something in place that's going to drive social change. And so uh, my question is kind of motivated. How do you put uh, either, can, is it possible or have you given any thought to putting an, a monetary value on the effect of social change that you're bringing about in order to, ha to have some sort of measure of that added change that you're bringing about and not just being um, just providing more of a, of a push to get this sort of movement to go on. Yeah, so um, if I understand the question correctly, I mean, for our work, it's not possible. I mean, I, I do agree with you. I think there are people that try to do that. The key is, though, I mean, the only way to really do that is in the context of our society, which means you have to be as narrow as possible about the social issue and the outcome you're looking for. It's not like this. The unfortunate thing is it's not this generic P&L, right? You either made money or you lost money, right? It's, and that's what our social issue reports are trying to do. So it's like school readiness is trying to prepare people to be ready by kindergarten, right? And research says that if you're ready by kindergarten, the long-term return to society is that they will be um, tax-paying citizens and they won't be using money in the future. So you really have to put in the context of what the return on investment might be, and that's a tricky thing. I think that the more we can try to do that, the better off that we are. Um, but that's a tricky thing. But my primary um, advice would be is that you want to be really clear on what's the social issue with what outcome you're trying to do with what population um, to do that. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Francis LaRosa. I'm a fourth year business administration student here in the College of Management. Um, and my question had to do actually with a title of the slide that you had actually earlier in your presentation uh, that was titled Social Progress Equals Societal Progress. Yeah. I was just kind of wondering if you could expand on that and like clarify, is it just an issue of scale or like, I just wanted to hear a little more about that maybe. So if I, if I understand again <clears throat> um, the question, and I'll, and I'll bring up the slide. Um, you know, my claim, which um, is that all the issues that are listed here, if whether it's the United States or globally, are going to be competitive and see more and more people prosper, which is, I think, what you, you would like to see, right? You'd like to see a larger percentage of people to have a high quality of life. These are issues that we can't ignore. And, and these are not saying that we need to find the next potato chip company that's going to supply 50 100,000, 2 million jobs, that these issues are connected to that next prosperity we're going to see. And so there is a link between driving what I think is social innovation on this screen and our own economic progress. Um, that's my perspective. You know, one may argue that you know, we can find other types of uh, ways to start new industries, but my perspective is that these are critical and they actually connect possibly to even those next industries. And you know, the two times in our country that we've seen significant prosperity, it's been when we found big industries that have started. And we're, we're only going to get out of this mess as if we actually get to that next growth curve, right? Um, 
And I'm just arguing we can't get to that next growth curve unless we actually deal with these things. And these are all things that are dealing with social innovation. And thank you so much for coming and presenting today. <laughs>